Hi guys, good morning. I pray you guys are all doing well. Today we actually have a Bible study. It's the Bible study that I've been talking to you guys about that I got on Good Friday. I finally taught it last night, so now I can share it with you guys. So just a couple housekeeping things before we jump right into this Bible study. I um I created kind of like a study guide for you guys, and so I attached it in the description bar. If you want, I highly encourage you guys to either print it out or pull it up so you can follow along with me during this Bible study because there's a part where I like explain a visual. And so if you're looking at it, you're going to understand it way more. Okay. And then second thing, if you have never read Exodus chapter 12, please read that chapter before you watch this Bible study, just so that you have the background and context as to what I'm talking about, okay? Because I always want to make sure that you guys are receiving the message the way it was intended. And so uh, with that said, we're going to jump right in. I'm just going to pray and we're going to start, okay? So Father God, I thank you for this revelation and I thank you for this Bible study. I thank you, Lord, for the lessons that you provide us. And I just pray, Father, that this lesson be like planted seed in the hearts and the minds of your people, and that they take heed to your warnings in this hour, Lord God, and that they receive it through their actions, Father God, displaying that they have received the message that is given today. I pray in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Okay, guys. So the title of this Bible study is Acknowledge My Name. Okay. And so... Like I told you guys, I received a revelation on Good Friday. I had read Exodus chapter 12, and then I was just recounting like the steps of Jesus' crucifixion since it was Good Friday. And what I realized is that there's a big parallel between the event of Passover in Exodus 12 and Jesus' crucifixion, like the events of Jesus' crucifixion. And so we know that uh, one of the parallels that everyone usually knows is that the blood that was put on the doorpost during Passover in Exodus chapter 12 is a foreshadowing of how Jesus would shed his blood for us in the crucifixion, right? But as I looked at these Passover instructions that are laid out in Exodus chapter 12, I realized that there's way more correlations between the Passover instructions and the steps of Jesus's crucifixion and the significance that that event holds. And so that's what I'm going to share with you guys today in Bible study. And then I'm going to tell you guys, like, why did God give me this revelation? Now, how does this apply to today in our lives? Okay. And so just to make sure we are all on the same page when we start this Bible study, I want to tell you guys what Passover means. So Passover is the Jewish celebration of the deliverance of the Israelites from bondage in Egypt after God sent the 10th plague, which is the angel of death, to pass over the land, killing all the firstborn Egyptians. Okay, And so Passover in Hebrew, the word is Pasach, and that word means to pass over. But in Aramaic, which is the dialect that Jesus spoke, Aramaic Hebrew, it means to be compassionate and have mercy. Okay, so to have compassion and to have mercy. So just remember that because that's going to tie in at the end. All right, so grab your study guides and let's jump, jump in. Okay, so the first correlation comes out of Exodus chapter 12, verse 5. And so just so you guys know, on this study guide, all the verses that you need are already there. So that way you're not flipping through your Bible. I put all the verses in there. And then where it says scriptures for reference, those are verses that I put in there to provide context to support these revelations that I'm sharing with you guys. You guys know that I, I will always back up what I say the Lord gave me, whatever revelation the Lord gave me with scripture, because it would be irresponsible of me to give you a revelation and not have scripture to support it, okay? So where it says scriptures for reference in blue, that's for you guys to read on your time if you want a little more context as to how that is shown in the Bible, okay? All right, so Exodus chapter 12, verse 5. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male, a year old. You may take it from the sheep or from the goats. 
So this is like towards the beginning of the instructions that the Israelites start to receive for the Passover. And so it, God tells them that they can take a lamb, but it has to be without blemish, a male a year old, and they can either take it from the sheep or from the goats. Now, this is where it all started for me. Because I was like, I know that a sheep, like a baby sheep is called a lamb, but a baby goat is called a kid. So how can you take a lamb from goats? That, that doesn't make any sense. So I started researching in the Bible where it mentions sheep and goats. And what caught my attention was a parable that Jesus said in Matthew chapter 25, verse 31 to 46. Okay. And so I'm going to read it to you guys. It says, when the son of man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne. Before him will be gathered all the nations and he will separate people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will place the sheep on his right, but the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, come, you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundations of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you drink? And when did we see you as a stranger and welcome you or naked and clothe you? And when did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will answer them. Truly, I say to you, as you did it to one of least of these, you did it to me. Verse 41, then he will say to those on his left, depart from me, you cursed into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry and you gave me no food. I was thirsty and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger and you did not welcome me naked and you did not clothe me sick and in prison and you did not visit me. Then they all will answer saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not minister to you? Then he will answer them saying, truly, I say to you, as as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. Okay. And so this, in this parable, what Jesus is explaining is that he is the great shepherd and therefore he has the authority. And at the end time judgment, he will separate the sheep, which is the righteous people from the goats, which is the unrighteous. So the sheep represents righteous and the goats represent unrighteous. So with this understanding, when we look at Exodus chapter 12, verse five, where it says you can either take this lamb from the sheep or from the goats, it's saying that the land that the lamb that will be chosen to be sacrificed is going to be a representative of both the sheep and from the goats. That's why it can be taken from either or. And so we know that Jesus is the lamb of God and that he died for the sins of all. Okay. We also know that Jesus is fully God and fully man when he was on the earth, okay? And so being fully God represents the righteous and being fully man represents the unrighteous, yet he was without sin. And that's why this lamb that was without blemish actually is a foreshadowing of Jesus because he was the lamb of God who was without sin or without blemish, yet he represented all, both the righteous and the unrighteous in dying on the cross for our sins. So that is the first correlation between these Passover instructions and Jesus's crucifixion. This is the first foreshadowing that the Lord revealed to me, okay? So now we're going to move on to the second correlation, okay? So the second correlation comes out of Exodus chapter 12, verse 7, and then verse 12 to 13. So verse 7 says, Then they shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts and the lintel of the houses in which they eat. And then this is 12 and 13. For I will pass through the land of Egypt that night, and I will strike all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and on all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgments. I am the Lord. The blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you and no plague will befall you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. Now, this is the correlation that I touched upon a little bit in the beginning of this video, where we all kind of know that the blood on the doorposts 
represents the blood that was shed by Jesus on the cross for us, right? Because it provided protection to the Israelites and it's the blood of Jesus that covers us. But I wanted to highlight where they put the blood. So they put the blood on two doorposts and a lentil. And if you're like me, I had no idea what a lentil was, but a lentil is the top part of a door. So really the two doorposts and the lentil make up the border of a door. So it's like the shape of an upside down U. And I just want you guys to remember that shape because it's gonna tie into the next correlation, okay? But something else that I wanted to share with you guys is that it says in verse 13, the blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you and no plague will befall you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. So really the blood, not only did it provide protection, but it provided a distinction. It clarified who were the people of God and who were not. So when the angel of death passed by, it knew not to touch the people of God. And so this foreshadows how Jesus' blood covers us as the people of God and how it protects us from harm, right? It protects us from the wrath of God. And so I just want to highlight this because I know in today's age, now more than ever, we're hearing all these things that induce fear, right? The attack that happened on Israel. We hear about rumors of wars. We're hearing about diseases. We're hearing about possible famine, right? And so we're probably sitting here worried like, God, what are we going to do, right? But I want to remind you that you are covered by the blood of Jesus and that we understand that these things are the wrath of God that is happening, right? He's casting his righteous judgment. But because you are covered by the blood of Jesus, you should know that though it's happening in the world, it doesn't mean that it's going to happen to you. If you truly believe that the Lord your God is the one who supplies all your needs and you are walking in obedience with him, then you should have nothing to worry about because you know that even if that just like God provides for the sparrows, he will provide for you. Okay. And he did not give us a spirit of fear. So know that you are covered by the blood and that it seals you. It marks you. It notes that you are under covenant with God and that you are a son or a daughter of God and own that and walk in that authority, walk in that understanding as we go through these times. Okay. So I just wanted to highlight that because I think it's needed for today. So now we're going to move on to the third correlation. Now, this is the meat of the revelation, okay? And so um, feel free in the comments throughout any part of this. If you guys have any questions or comments, feel free to share, okay? So this one comes out of Exodus chapter 12, verse 15. And it says, seven days you shall eat unleavened bread. On the first day, you shall remove leaven out of your houses. For if anyone eats what is leaven from the first day until the seventh day, that person shall be cut off from Israel. Now, the first thing that the Holy Spirit highlighted to me was the time frame in this verse. Seven days. Okay. We know that it took Jesus seven days to complete his mission from when he walked well, not walked, when he was on the donkey and he rode into Jerusalem, which is known as Palm Sunday, to when he rose on the third day, which is known as Resurrection Sunday, that is seven days. That is why we celebrate Holy Week, right? And we know in Genesis that God created the world in six days and on the seventh day he rested. And so seven in the Bible represents completion. But when I was looking into the book of Mark, about the details of Jesus's crucifixion, I realized that there's a time frame that is provided. So in Mark chapter 15, verse 25, it says, and it was the third hour when they crucified him. So that means Jesus was put on the cross on the third hour. And the third hour in Jewish time is 9 a.m. Then Mark chapter 15, verse 33 to 37 says, And when the sixth hour had come, there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lema sabachthani, 
which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And some of the bystanders hearing it said, behold, he is calling Elijah. And someone ran and filled a sponge with sour wine, put it on a reed and gave it to him to drink saying, wait, let us see whether Elijah will come to take him down. And Jesus uttered a loud cry and breathed his last. So according to this verse, Jesus breathed his last breath on the cross at the ninth hour. And the ninth hour in Jewish time is 3 p.m. So the time frame that Jesus' body was on the cross was from 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. Now, for all of us, that's six hours, right? 9, 10, 11, 12, 1, 2, 3. That's six hours. But when I was studying Jewish time to understand what third hour, sixth hour, ninth hour meant, I learned that the Jewish people did not implement the concept of starting to count at the number zero until 650 A.D., way after Jesus's crucifixion. So that means during the time of Jesus's crucifixion, they were starting to count at the number one. So when we count, when we say nine to 10 p.m., we say that's one hour because we count 9 a.m. as zero. And then we count 10 a.m. as one. But back during those times, they counted 9 a.m. as one, 10 a.m. as two. So with this understanding, how many hours was Jesus on the cross? 9, 10, 11, 12, 1, 2, 3. Seven hours. And so this seven days, the number seven in general that is highlighted in Exodus 12, 15 is a foreshadowing of the time frame it would take for Jesus to accomplish his mission, both from Palm Sunday to Resurrection Sunday and from the time his body was put on the cross to the time he took his last breath. Okay. So I'm sure you're probably asking yourself, okay, so seven days, but why did they have to eat unleavened bread? Okay. And so for that part of the sentence, we're going to look at Matthew chapter 26, verse 17 to 26. This is what it says. Now on the first day of unleavened bread, the disciples came to Jesus saying, where will you have us prepare for you to eat the Passover? He said, go into the city to a certain man and say to him, the teacher says, my time is at hand. I will keep the Passover at your house with my disciples. And the disciples did as Jesus had directed them and they prepared the Passover. When it was evening, he reclined at the table with the 12. And as they were eating, he said, truly, I say to you, one of you will betray me. And they were very sorrowful and began to say to him one after another, is it I, Lord? He answered, he who has dipped his hand in the dish with me will betray me. The son of man goes as it is written of him, but woe to that man by whom the son of man is betrayed. It would have been better for that man if he had not been born. Judas, who had betrayed him, answered, is it I, Rabbi? He said to him, you have said so. Now, as they were eating, Jesus took the bread and after blessing it, broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, take, eat. This is my body. So this passage is describing the last supper that Jesus has with his disciples before he ends up being arrested and what happens on the crucifixion crucifixion takes place, right? And so I want you guys to pay attention. So in twenty verse 26, God takes the bread and says, take, eat, this is my body. So the bread that God is holding in this passage represents his body. Okay, now if you go back to the beginning of this passage, Matthew 26, verse 17 to 26, verse 18 says, he said, go into the city to a certain man and say to him, the teacher says, my time is at hand. I will keep the Passover at your house with my disciples. So this last supper meal was the meal that was instructed to be eaten during Passover in Exodus chapter 12. And what is the instruction that was given in regards to bread that we read in Exodus chapter 12, verse 15, that they shall only eat unleavened bread. And so the fact that they ate seven, for seven days unleavened bread is a foreshadowing of how we would acknowledge what Jesus did on the cross. Because what do we do when we take communion? We eat a cracker that is dry with no yeast, which represents unleavened bread because unleavened bread is bread without yeast, is dry and it's flat. 
And that's the same bread that Jesus was holding in his hand when in Matthew 26, when he says, take, eat, this is my body. Okay. So do you guys see, I hope you guys can catch this and see how the, for Exodus chapter 12, 15 to say seven days, you shall eat unleavened bread. Not only was it foreshadowing the time frame that Jesus would take to fulfill his mission, both from entering Jerusalem to uh, rising on the third day, right? But it also represents why we celebrate what he did on the cross. So I hope that's clear because that was deep. And I hope you guys caught that. But there's more to this one. So hang in there with me, okay? So this verse, Exodus chapter 12, 15, also stresses that there can be no leaven in the bread during these seven days that they're eating it, right? And that if they do put leaven, that person's cut off from Israel. So it's a pretty big deal if you have leaven, right? And so I started wondering, like, what's the difference between leaven and unleavened bread? And so just so if you guys don't know, leavened bread is fermented bread that contains yeast. So basically like the loaf of bread that you would see at the supermarket. But unleavened bread has no yeast. It's deflated and it's dry. It's like a cracker, okay? And so when I started researching between these two breads, one of the verses that caught my attention was 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 8. And it says, Let us therefore celebrate the festival, not with the old leaven, the leaven of malice and evil, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. And so here in this verse, leaven is associated to malice and evil, which we know are associated to sin, right? But it says the opposite of unleavened bread. So when you look at that verse and that understanding, you can make the assumption that leavened bread represents a life of sin because the yeast in that verse is correlated with sin and leaven is full of sin. So to be full of sin means you are living in sin, right? Now, unleavened bread is the opposite. And so if you deflate sin from your life, what do you have? You live a life of humility, Okay, so unleavened bread represents a life of humility. And I hope you guys are following on along with the notes because you guys will see the chart that I created for you guys so you don't have to be frantically writing all this down, okay? And so leavened bread represents life of, a, life of sin and unleavened bread represents life of humility, okay? Now, at this point, this is where the title of the Bible study comes, where it says, acknowledge my name. Now, while I was doing this research, I heard the Lord say to me, acknowledge my name. Now, I used to wear a bracelet that in Hebrew says Yahweh Yireh, which means the Lord will provide. And I literally, literally, guys, when I finished this Bible study, I lost the bracelet. I woke up one morning and it wasn't on me. I checked everywhere and I can't find the bracelet anywhere. And so this bracelet had the word Yahweh written in Hebrew. And I put it here on top of the chart for you guys. So if you don't know what it looks like, you can see it. And so if you look at the name Yahweh in Hebrew, you notice that the main letter that repeats itself looks like a doorpost. You guys remember that image from the second correlation about the doorpost and the lentil, how it makes an upside down U? Well, that's what these letters look like, upside down U's, right? But they have openings in them. And so... Then I got this idea in my head that now that I know, now I know it was the Holy Spirit. I, I thought to myself, I wonder what unleavened bread and leavened bread looks like written in Hebrew. And so that is what you guys see in these, um, these red words that are written in parentheses. That is the spelling of leavened bread and unleavened bread in Hebrew. And if you look at them, you realize that they're very similar. The letters are almost identical. The only real difference is in these two letters that look like doorposts. In leavened bread, the doorpost is completely closed. So the complete upside down U, right? But in unleavened bread, it has that opening just like the letter and the name Yahweh. So I started researching these two Hebrew letters. And so this is what I found. We're going to start with the one that's in unleavened bread. 
So that letter, which is the same letter that's found in the name Yahweh, is called He. And it's the fifth letter on the Hebrew alphabet. It means here is behold to disturb. And it's actually comprised of two other Hebrew letters, which is Yud and Dalit. So if you put Yud and Dalit together, it makes up the letter He. And Yud is the 10th letter of the Hebrew alphabet, and it means Jew and hand of God. And Dalit is the fourth letter in the Hebrew alphabet, and it means door, lift up, poor and afflicted. Now, when I was writing down these definitions, I was like, wait a minute. Who do we know was a Jew who's known as the right hand of God, who's known as the door of the sheep, right? The way, the truth, and the life, who lifts up the poor and the afflicted. It's Jesus. And so that makes sense because if these two letters make up hey, and hey means here is behold, to disturb, we know that when some, someone says, behold, they're saying you are in the presence of. And so when we are in the presence of Jesus, what happens? Our flesh is disturbed because he is holy. And so our sin is disturbed that is within us. Okay. And that is what causes us to feel convicted and to confess our sins. If you want reference to that, this is not in the notes, but you guys can go and read Isaiah chapter six. It gives you an idea of, of what it's like when we're in the presence of God. You see how Isaiah reacts when he's in the presence of God. He starts saying, oh, I'm, I'm filthy, right? To the point where the angel ends up cleansing him by putting coal on his lips. So, so this makes sense why this letter, hey, would represent Jesus. Because the definitions match. And this is the same letter that's found in the name Yahweh. And we know that Jesus is the son of God, right? And so to live a life of humility, you need Jesus because he is the way to maintain sin deflated. And so this is why the letter He is found in the spelling of unleavened bread. All right, so now we're going to move on to the next one. We're going to move on to the doorpost letter that's found in leaven bread. So that letter is called Chet or Chess. Um, and it's the eighth letter of the Hebrew alphabet, and it means life. But when I was researching the letter, they had a verse associated to it. And it was Genesis chapter four, verse six through seven. And it says, the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry and why has your face fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door. Its desire is contrary to you, but you must rule over it. So if you guys don't know, this passage comes from after Cain and Abel offered their sacrifices to God. I mean, not their sacrifices, excuse me. They offered their offerings to God and God accepted Abel's offering. Cain and, Cain and Abel are brothers. And so because God accepted Abel's offering, Cain got jealous to the point where he wanted to kill his brother. And so this is God having a conversation with Cain before he ends up acting on his emotions. He's basically telling him, acknowledge that your emotions are because of sin and don't act on it. Subdue the flesh. Okay. But we know he ends up acting on it. But I want to point something out. God says, sin is crouching at your door. That's the phrase that he uses when he's talking to Cain. Now, if we take that phrase literally, and we look at these two doorpost letters, chess and hay, we see that sin can get into both of these doors, so to speak, right? Because both of the bottoms are completely open. And that is true about the different life styles as well. When you live a life of sin, sin can creep right in. But it's also true that when you're living a life of humility, sin can creep in at times, right? But I want you guys to pay attention to something. Which way gives you a way out of sin that allows sin to be deflated. It's through hay. Because if sin were to get in through the bottom, it can get out through that little opening that's on the side. But if you look at Chet, 
there is no way out once sin comes in. And that's why it ferments and it rises in. And that's what causes people to have a life of sin. Okay? And so the importance here is to remember that God has made a way for us to subdue the flesh. To maintain our sin from overtaking our lives to maintain it deflated so that we can live a life of humility and the way he did that is through Jesus and so in going back to Exodus chapter 12 verse 15 which was the main verse for this correlation the reason why they stress no leaven is because eating only leavened bread foreshadowed how we have to choose to live a humble life to truly acknowledge what Jesus did on the cross. Because that's how we acknowledge that he is the way out of sin. Because that's what he did for us on the cross. He provided a way for us out of sin. And so I hope you guys were able to understand that and I explained it how I had to explain it. And so just if you guys need a verse to back up that revelation, you guys can look at 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 14, verse 13, excuse me. And that is listed under the verses in correlation three on the notes. OK. And so now we're going to jump into the last correlation and then we're going to tie this up and we're going to understand why the Lord provided this revelation during this time. OK. So the last correlation is Exodus chapter 12, verse 22 to 24. And it says, take a bunch of hyssop and dip it into the blood that it is that is in the basin and touch the lintel and the two doorposts with the blood that is in the basin. None of you shall go out of the door of his house until the morning for the Lord will pass through to strike the, Egypt the Egyptians. And when he sees the blood on the lintel and on the two doorposts, the Lord will pass over the door and will not allow the destroyer to enter your houses or to strike you. You shall observe this right as a statute for you and for your sons forever. Now, remember how I told you guys that I was looking over the accounts of Jesus' crucifixion after I read Exodus chapter 12? Well, this verse in Exodus caught my attention because it notes hyssop. And I had just read hyssop in John chapter 19, verse 29 to 30 that day. So it says a jar full of sour wine stood there. So they put a sponge full of the sour wine on a hyssop branch and held it to his mouth. When Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Now, in my Bible commentary, it notes in John 19, 29 to 30, that the people that gave Jesus sour wine were the very soldiers that were crucifying him. And so Jesus, in the verse prior to this, says, I'm thirsty. And so they provide the sour wine. Now, the sour wine that they provide, in my commentary notes, that it's the same wine that they would carry around throughout the day to maintain themselves hydrated. Okay? And so really... What the soldiers do in this hour, what, what this image is depicting is compassion through sacrifice for cleansing. Compassion in that the very soldiers that were crucifying Jesus took a moment to respond to him saying, I'm thirsty. Sacrifice in that they gave the very wine that they were keeping to stay hydrated to Jesus to quench his thirst, right? And cleansing, sorry, cleansing, it represents cleansing because they did it on a hyssop. They put the sour wine on a hyssop. And so I knew that there was a correlation between the hyssop mentioned in Exodus 12, 24, and the hyssop mentioned in John 19, 29 to 30. And what I realized, what the correlation is, is that the image that's described in Exodus 12, 22 to 24 actually ties in to the significance of why Jesus died on the cross. And so if you're looking at the notes, I wrote it out for you guys on the bottom. And it says, it was because of God's compassion and mercy for us that he sacrificed his son, Jesus, so that we are provided a way to be cleansed of our sins. So that's the reason for Jesus's crucifixion, right? 
Now, in the image in Exodus 12, 22 to 24, what are the parts that we have? We have hyssop, we have a door, we have blood, and it happens during Passover, right? So, in the significance of Jesus' crucifixion, in that sentence, we see Passover or Pasach is represented in that the reason for um, Jesus' crucifixion, it was done because of God's compassion and mercy. And we know, like I told you guys in the beginning, Pasach, the definition in Aramaic Hebrew is to have compassion and mercy. So that's where that ties in. So we, so Jesus is associated with the blood in Exodus chapter 12, 22 to 24. And we know that he provides a way which is associated with the door in that same verse. And then to be cleansed, which is represented by the hyssop of our sins. So when the Israelites in Exodus 12, in this verse, 22 to 24, were putting the blood on the doorpost using hyssop during Passover, what they were creating was an image that foreshadows what would be the significance as to why Jesus died on the cross. Because he died on the cross for our sins. And what were the Israelites keeping out from the Passover, they were keeping out the angel of death. And what is the outcome of sin if it was not cleansed? Death. So this is how we see this correlation in between Exodus 12, 22 to 24 and the significance of Jesus' crucifixion. Okay? And so that was the revelation that I received on Good Friday. How... There are so many parallels between the instructions in Passover and how it ties to what happened during Jesus' crucifixion and what that signifies to us, right? And so I sat with the Lord and I asked him, Lord, why are you giving me this? What does this all mean? And so I'm going to share that with you guys. So the purpose of the revelation I believe God provided this revelation to remind us that just as he provided deliverance from bondage through the, through the blood of the lamb for the Israelites, so too has he provided us deliverance from the bondage of sin through the blood of Jesus. And this is something we know, right? So why do we think that God is bringing it up? And what the Holy Spirit revealed to me is that he is bringing it up because we are not utilizing this gift, the gift that Jesus did on the cross, to make a way for us to come into the presence of God like we're supposed to. Because if we truly cherish it and acknowledge it, we would be putting Jesus first in our lives. If you guys go back to the chart and look at the letter H that represents Jesus, in the spelling of unleavened bread. Where is the letter H positioned? It's first. And so to maintain living a life of humility unto God, we have to be putting Jesus first. God is calling us into a time of sanctification. Sanctification means to make one holy and so how you make one holy is by revealing the things in them that are not holy and so we've noticed this theme that God is highlighting how we need to really pay attention to the sin that is taking over our lives and to the carelessness honestly that causes us to run into these struggles and these trials that we run into when we lean on our own understanding and we're not seeking the Lord. And so he's addressing this fast food mindset that some of us have been having in how we pursue God. And what I mean by fast food mindset is that when we run into an issue Right When we're dealing with stuff in life, we try to handle it ourselves and we do everything that we think we can do in our power before we actually come to God. And when we finally come to God and in his mercy, he responds to us. When we finally feel that relief and we get a solution, we lean back 
in our pursuit for God. And we start treating him like an auction again, where if I have some time during the day, I'm going to see if I can fit in a little study time. I'm going to see if I can pray a little bit, right? That's a fast food mindset because most people, when they go to eat fast food, is because they're starving. They need to eat immediately. They need a solution for their hunger. And so that's what this mindset does when you're pursuing God this way. And so once they eat their food and they're satisfied, they go about their day. But one thing about fast food is that when you eat it, you realize you get hungry much faster because an hour later you need something else again, right? And that's the same thing that happens to us spiritually when we see God this way. When we, we treat him like a fast food joint and we only jump into the word because we need a solution because everything else we tried isn't working. And the minute, because he's so gracious, because he's so merciful, the minute that he answers a solution and provides us some relief, we sit back like, okay, I don't need to go hard no more for God. I don't need to be getting up in the morning. I don't need to be in my word every day. I don't need to be praying because I, I feel relief now in my life. But I'm going to tell you right now, guys, that that leaves you spiritually hungry. And God is addressing this right now because he's calling us to assume the position of disciples because the harvest is ready. It's out there already. There are people looking for light, looking for hope because the world is dark. And God is saying, where are my laborers? And we can be laborers if we're not putting Jesus first so that we are filled in the spirit. Because how are you supposed to pour into someone else if you barely have enough for yourself to keep you going? And so... What we need to do is we need, start, we need to start approaching God and pursuing him with this five-star restaurant mentality, okay? And what I mean by that is that when you go to a five-star restaurant, what do you do? The first thing you do is you make a reservation because you understand that it's a prestigious place. And so you need to set the time ahead of time, right? So you make a reservation, Many of us plan ahead. We start looking at what are we going to wear to go there or we check the menu online so we know what we're going to order, right? And then when we get into the restaurant, we savor every single bit of that food because we understand that that plate was expensive. So we're going to eat it all up. We're not going to let nothing go to waste, right? That is how we are supposed to be pursuing the Lord. That is how we acknowledge that Jesus is first in our life. We make reservations every day to spend time with him. Preferably, honestly, you should be doing this as the first of your day. Jesus rose before the sun. We should be doing the same. My spiritual mother and father have taught me that it's good to seek the Lord between the hours of 3 a.m. and 6 a.m. Because during that time, the world is quiet and we're most likely to hear the Lord better. Okay, so that's why they encourage to seek the Lord during that time before the sun rises. And so when we set an appointment every day with God, when we set a reservation, that's how we put him first. And then when you have this reservation, make sure that you plan ahead so that no distractions or obstacles get in the way of you keeping your reservation with God every day. Because we know that the enemy is going to be attacking. He's still going to be coming for you. He's still going to be trying to make ways to not allow you to get in God's presence, right? And so we try to beat him to the punch. If you know that you have to be up at a certain time and you have to do certain things, then schedule your time that it leaves you with enough time to really spend time in the presence of the Lord, that you're there mentally and physically, okay? We have to be more diligent in our discipline and our, what's the word, Holy Spirit? Our discipline and accountability. Thank you, Holy Spirit. We need to be more disciplined and accountable in how we seek the Lord. And so that requires planning ahead, putting things to place in our life so that we are giving God are all when we are in his presence okay and so when you're in his presence you should savor everything you're receiving everything that the lord is downloading all the words you're reading savor that all and why because it is expensive it was expensive for you to have this opportunity to come into god's presence it costs jesus his life. That's how expensive this was for you to have this gift that you can get into God's presence and come to him with everything. 
everything. And honestly, guys, I think the reason why we make excuses and why we struggle with keeping up with the diligence that is required, with the reverence that is required for the Lord, is because we don't take time to acknowledge what that means, what Jesus did on the cross. We don't take time to acknowledge that. Do we understand that if Jesus did not die on the cross for our sins, the minute we were to step into the presence of God Almighty, we would die instantly because he is holy. And so our flesh is tainted with sin and where he resides, sin cannot reside because where there is light, darkness cannot reside. And so we would die instantly. We would not be able to get even a word out because our flesh would not be able to handle his holiness. It would be so disturbed to the point we die. And so if Jesus did not die on the cross, we would not have that shield that when we go to God, he sees Jesus. He doesn't see us. And that allows us to come to him with all our worries, all our concerns, and to receive his instruction, his favor, his blessings, his gentle rebukes, his mercy. Do you understand how many gifts comes from us being in God's presence? So why do we treat this? Like it's an option, like, like it doesn't really matter. Like when we have time, we put everything else before God. Why do we do this? Well, I'm telling you guys now, God is not putting up for it anymore. And I say this as a big sister in Christ in love, but God gave me this word and I felt the reverence in this word. He is not putting up for this anymore. It's either he is a priority or he is not. And if he is not, that leaves you susceptible with the wrath that everyone else is going to get. God has drawn a line. Choose this day whom you will serve. He has called us to a higher standard and he's saying, I need you to respond. And I'm going to tell you guys that when I received this word and I was meditating on it uh, this morning before I share it with you guys. I felt the grief of the Holy Spirit meditating on this word because I remember the times before I decided to say, yes, God, I'm going to be disciplined. Yes, I'm going to hold myself accountable. I'm going to put you first. Before I did that, I started, it's like the Holy Spirit brought to my mind all those times when God would nudge me in the morning to wake up because he had something on his heart he wanted to share with me or there was something he wanted to warn me of that I was going to come across in my day. And because it wasn't convenient or comfortable for me, I would snooze my alarm or I would turn around and just go back to bed. And how during the day I would see signs from God. And because I was too occupied with everything else that we usually get occupied with in life, right? Work and family and responsibilities. And, and I can't believe to say this, but social media, we put these kind of things over God. And God, because he loves us so much, because of his mercy, He's, he's trying all these things to grab our attention to say, listen, I need you to put me first. Not because of like, he just wants to be like down, like rough with us. And he's like, this is how it is. No, it's because he understands that this benefits us. Like we should be doing it to show him reverence. Don't get me wrong. But the reality is being in God's presence is to benefit us. Because it's like receiving a cheat code for life. Because when you get in God's presence, you're getting into the presence of the all-knowing God, the Alpha and the Omega, the creator of the earth. And so whatever problem you're dealing with, he has the solution because he created all things and he is sovereign over all. So the Lord is telling us to take heed to this message and to use the gift he's given us. Get in God's presence. And guys, the reason why we're getting this message now is because what is coming, the only way, and please hear me out, the only way you are going to be able to make it through what is coming is if you are diligently pursuing the Lord in reverence and walking in strict obedience to every instruction that he gives. That is the only way you're going to make it through what's coming. 
just like the Israelites had to walk in complete faith and obedience and take those Passover instructions and do them accordingly, so too it's going to be during this time. I told you guys, we are stepping into our own modern day exodus. And nothing is new under the sun. God is requiring the same faith and obedience and discipline that the Israelites demonstrated when they followed those Passover instructions. He's requiring it of us now. So take heed to this warning. Now, what I wanted to do on my part was share with you guys some practical steps that you guys can take to a, to put God first in your life because maybe you're not aware of that, okay? So I want to share with you guys some of the steps that my spiritual parents have taught me that I have implemented in my life and I have seen the fruit of it, okay? And so the first step is to give God the first of your day before you pick up your phone to check social media, before you deal with the responsibilities of work and family and kids. The first thing you need to do is give God your time. Get in his presence, okay? Get into your secret place first thing in the morning. And I'm gonna tell you guys, that this has changed the game for me. This has changed my whole walk with God doing this. I rise up before the sun. For me, the time that works for me in my life is 4.30 in the morning. I wake up at 4.30 in the morning every day to spend time with God. That's just what fits my lifestyle. You guys can pick whatever time between 3 a.m. and 6 a.m. for what works for you, okay? And that helps my mindset to be where it needs to be to take on the rest of the day. I have much more grace with everyone when I'm in God's presence in the morning after I spend time with him. I am able to look at situations from God's point of view. I am more open to being the hands and feet of Jesus and to share his love and compassion in the circumstances that are presented to me during the day. And during that time, that's where God has shared with me things and warnings to come and it helps me to be prepared. And sometimes God will wake me up out of the ordinary from the time that I have reserved for him. But I've learned that when he does that, it's because he's trying to keep me from something that the enemy has already planned for me that day. And I'm going to give you guys an example. Yesterday, when I had to teach this Bible study, God woke me up at three o'clock in the morning. I usually wake up at 4.30, but I knew he, he had me up for a reason. And I tell you guys, the minute I finished spending time with God, my daughter woke up and started vomiting. And it was just, it was consistent. Like every half hour she was having, she was, she was going to the bathroom and vomiting. And so had I not listened to God and got up when he told me to get up, I wouldn't have spent the time with him. My mindset wouldn't have been in the place that it needed to be to be there for my daughter and to not be stressed out and overwhelmed. And it would and it would have impacted my ability to deliver this word to my Bible study group. And so this is why I'm telling you guys it's so important to keep God first and give him the first of your day. It will, you will see, it will benefit your life so much. The second thing is to be in the word and in prayer daily, okay? With any relationship, you know that in order for the, the relationship to grow, there has to be communication. And so how does God communicate with us? He communicates with us through the word, through the Bible, and when we pray, and so we have to be doing these things every day if we want to hear from God. You know, a lot of times I hear like, oh, God doesn't speak to me. Like, I just wish God would give me instruction of what to do here and there. But I really like, I want you guys to look at these steps and it's like, am I doing these things? Because if I'm not doing these things, how am I supposed to hear from God? I just, we need to be real right now, guys. And I, I'm coming to you guys as a big sister because I want you guys to be under God's covering for whatever's coming. I want you guys to take heed and become disciplined and accountable in how you seek the Lord. One, because the Lord deserves it. We need to gain this, this 
reverence and the fear of the Lord. We need to get this back in the church because this is why the church has lost its power and authority and why we see hell running rampant in the world. We need to address this. And so he's calling on the remnant to fix the mistakes that we see in the body of Christ. So we need to rise up to the call. And so be in your word and be in prayer daily so you can hear from the Lord and you can receive the instruction he wants to give you. The third one is confess our sins. Okay. And now the week I got the revelation, I had read that week 1 John 1 9 and, the ver and this verse stuck out to me. It says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And when I looked into the word confess, the, the deeper meaning in Hebrew means for persons to assemble. So for people to come together. And what I realized is that in this verse, what it's saying is when we come together with God, when we come into his presence, he gives us the opportunity through Jesus to lay out all our darkness, all our sin, all the things that are in us that if they are left there will ferment and cause us to end up living a life of sin. He gives us this opportunity to lay it all out before him. And when we lay out all this darkness, all this sin in his mercy, he shines his light over it. And we know guys that where light is, there is no darkness. And so this is how he cleanses us of unrighteousness. And the beautiful thing about this is that we have the opportunity to do this as much as necessary until what has been festering in us, whatever sin has been fermenting in us, is removed. And that is such a gift, guys. And we should be using it regularly because not only will it free you from shame and guilt, which holds you back from really receiving everything God wants to give you, but it keeps your life humble. It keeps you in alignment with God's will. It keeps you from developing a mindset of pride. Okay, and so take advantage of this gift. And even if there's not a certain sin that you know you're fighting with, you should still come to God and ask the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, please reveal to me if there's anything that is providing a, a grievance to the Lord. And he will. And I'm going to tell you guys now that this is where I received deliverance. When I was doing this Bible study, because I did that very thing. When I noticed this theme of sanctification, I knew God was calling us to humble ourselves and repent. And that's what I did. And I said, God, if there's anywhere where I'm bringing you grief, please reveal it to me. And that's what he did. And this actually ties into number four, which is seeks God's will over our own needs. And I actually, I actually told this to you guys in one of the videos. I'm forgetting the title right now. But what the Holy Spirit revealed to me when I did that, when I came into God's presence and I asked him that, was that even though I was doing steps one, two, and three, I was giving God the first of my day. I was in my word and prayer. I was confessing my sins. Sin has still crept into my life in that it was influencing my motive to pursue the Lord. Okay? So sin was influencing my motive to pursue the Lord. And so when the enemy knows that he can't stop you from seeking God, he will shift your perspective as to why you're seeking God. And so what this looks like, or at least in my situation, what this looked like was that during my quiet time with God, it had become very self-centered. All my prayers and everything that I was addressing was all about like, God, when is the promise going to come forward? God, can you please give me instruction with these decisions? God, can you clarify this? God, like, can you just answer me on this, right? And so it was all about me, me, me. God, can you do, 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 right? And so I was so focused on where I was at in life and how we're going through this transition and this in-between period that I had forgotten to pause for a minute and say, God, what is your will for me today? Where do you want to utilize me to advance your kingdom? Because this is something I used to include every day at the end of my quiet time with God. I would do like Samuel does in the Bible and I would say, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. And I, during this like past two weeks, three weeks or so, I had stopped doing that because I just wanted to hear what I wanted to hear from the Lord pertaining to my situation. And so we have to remember like it says in Matthew 6, 33, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness 
and all these things will be added to you. So we have to be seeking God's will first. Understanding that when we're in alignment with God's will, he perfects everything that concerns us. And literally, that is like truth. Because I can at least say from, from my experience, the times when I'm walking in God's will and I'm in alignment with, with what he wants me to do, it brings me joy. It brings me joy to know that I am walking in alignment with God. It brings me peace and relief. And so when that joy hits, that's how God addresses the internal things that got messed up with all the worry you were carrying with the, the, the concerns that you have in your life. So he replaces that worry with joy. And at the same time, he keeps you occupied in his will so that he has room to work on the things that are concerning us. Because we as people like to meddle. We put our hands on everything. And so even though we're saying, I trust you, God, we're over here trying to look for ways to fix it. And so sometimes he needs to distract us. And so he asks us, get into my will. So as we're doing his will, he's perfecting all the things that were worrying us because he's that good of a father. And so guys, if you take nothing from this Bible study, I just want you guys to remember that Jesus is not an option. He is a priority. And he's requiring that our actions align with our words. If we're saying that we love him with all our heart, mind, and soul, and that we cherish what he did on the cross, our actions should be demonstrating that. When we get a gift that we cherish, we utilize it as much as possible. Or we place it somewhere where everybody can see it because we're proud of it. And when people ask us about this gift, we're so quick to share about how we got it or what it means to us. But I want you guys to ask yourself, are you doing that about Jesus? Are you utilizing the gift that he's given us through the cross to come into God's presence diligently every day? with such gratitude to be there and to receive all he has to share. When you step out into the world, do people see Jesus when they see you in your actions? Is his compassion demonstrated through your, your acts and how you treat people? And when you are given the opportunities, are you sharing what the Lord has done in your life with joy? Because you cherish and understand what was done on the cross. Let's give God the reverence that is due in this hour. And honor him with our discipline and accountability in our pursuit for him. One, because he is deserving of it. He gave up everything for us. And two, because... This is the warning he's giving us because he loves us so much that he's showing us how do we stay under his covering for the events to come. And so I just pray that this Bible study be edifying to your walks, that you guys are able to take what you need from this, and that it help you guys grow as disciples. So until next time, bye. Love you.